Order, order. Mr. Robert Sims. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Saunders. It's a pleasure to have this adjournment de debate today about a matter which is uh, concerning my constituents and causing great anger and great distress. I know the Minister has been delayed and will be here in a moment, so uh, I've already had a conversation with him, so he's aware of the very real concerns, so he will have no trouble answering the debate. I represent Poole. It's a great constituency. It is mixed. It has areas of poverty and deprivation, but it also has some very uh, exclusive uh, areas with um, quite high-status housing, posh box of flats, um, some big houses, uh, Branksome Park, Camphor Cliffs, Sandbanks, and Penhill are strong residential areas uh, which are um, uh, lived in uh, by generally a lot of professional people who work very hard all their lives. Uh, it is an area with few pubs. Uh, indeed, it's uh, difficult to get a drink there. There's one or two wine bars and two or three hotels, but by and large, historically, it's not an area you'd go for a pub crawl or go to have a night out drinking. You'd either go to the Key and Pool or to the centre of Bournemouth. Uh, excitement normally is if a car alarm goes off or if a fox gets into the dustbins of a particular home and makes a noise. So it's not a high crime area generally. It's a very peaceful area. Uh, it's an area that people enjoy uh, to live in. And it's an area which um, constituents sometimes have to work very hard uh, to buy a place. Um, what we have seen in recent years, though, is residential property being used inappropriately as party houses. Um, this is for stag parties, for hen parties, sometimes for raves, sometimes for family parties. Um, what has been happening is that um, at the moment there are seven or eight homes in the area where... Um, uh, a number of businesses uh, run websites um, which rent these properties out for several hundred pounds a night over a weekend. And um, some of these properties are, are one, at the smaller end with uh, three or four bedrooms which have been converted internally to take 14 or 15 um, revelers. Uh, others are slightly larger where they can take 40 or 50 revelers who uh, turn up on a Friday in order to have a good time. I don't particularly blame uh, the people that want to have a good time. They uh, look at the uh, web, uh, they c clearly want to enjoy themselves. And the economics of it is that if you rent a private house and you can buy all your booze at a supermarket, actually it's rather cheaper than going to stay in a hotel. But the reality is uh, this spills over into causing trouble in what is a residential area. Um, apart from uh, car doors slamming and uh, noise, uh, you get people playing football in the garden, uh, you get music all hours of the uh, day, there have been stories of people playing football at 3 o'clock in the morning in the garden of some of these homes, bottles chucked over, uh, constituents uh, next door to some of the properties with trees find that people having had quite a lot to drink uh, jump into their garden and start trying to climb the trees. And it, it is causing a real problem. Um, the agency that uh, lets out some of these homes provide other services. They've, they shuttle them in sometimes to clubs in Bournemouth, so it goes quiet for an hour or two and then they come back at two or three in the morning and continue to cause a nuisance. Uh, the people that uh, rent these places out do get the people to sign a document saying uh, they'll be, they're peaceful and they're in a residential area, but the reality is that there's no real policing of these people. And if you get 15 people or 20 people or 30 people wanting to have a good time and who've drunk to excess, then that leads to a spillover of antisocial behaviour. Um, and the reality is that it really upsets constituents uh, who now fear uh, the onset of a weekend when people are going to um, come into the area. Um, my, I had a meeting on Saturday where 20 or 30 people turned up to represent various houses in the area and to, to set out their concerns. Um, the reality is we have to do something about this because it's making people's lives a misery. Constituents are fearful on Friday afternoon to have a look at these homes and see the number of cars which have come in. They pray for rain because people stay inside rather than stay outside. Um, they know there's going to be antisocial behavior. Um, uh, some of the websites letting homes have associated services. If you're a hen party, you can rent a naked butler, uh, which is uh, a cause of some concern when they're serving drinks on a hot afternoon in the garden and visible to neighbors. And it, it does impact on many of the families. Uh, a constituent of mine told me on Saturday he arrived home um, with his young daughter, I think seven or eight, to find that the house next door had uh, blow-up dolls bought from a, um, a sex shop all the way around the veranda. He had to tiptoe over and ask them to take it down, which they did. 
but this is in a, most of it is high spirits, most of it is youngsters wanting to have some fun, and we've all been young once, even me. But the reality is, in a residential area, this is inappropriate, and it spills over into, um, I think, activities which are, 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 are very inappropriate indeed. One of my constituents wrote to me in the email and said, there's so much I can write about. The screaming, the shouting, prostitutes being delivered well into the night, um, uh, heart, loud bass music thumping day and night, car doors banging, taxes coming and going, bottles thrown into our garden. I truly don't know where to begin. We're exhausted already, and quite a lot of people under the doctor. I hear stories of um, elderly people bar uh, barricading themselves in a home because of the noise. I know there's a retired solicitor and his wife who've bought a caravan so they can get out at weekends and actually get a night's sleep. So this is causing uh, real distress to my constituents. Now, the environmental health people in Poole have been doing their best in terms of noise, but with several homes and with shift systems and a limited number of um, machines for measuring um, disturbance, it is difficult because it's a sort of moving target. Uh, but they're doing their best, and they've been serving some notices. Um, there's the issue of is this a change of use or not. I understand there is some case law in Sussex that you can actually apply for a change of use, but there are a variety of properties. One or two have just been bought to be party homes because they're a very good investment and can generate sometimes two or three thousand pounds for a weekend. But I know at least one case where a constituent lives in the home Monday to Thursday, moves out to a caravan, and lets his own home for parties for one or two thousand pounds a weekend. So that wouldn't qualify uh, for change of use. The police really spend most of the focus. Um, in central Bournemouth. Uh, occasionally they get called, uh, but they try and stay out, I think, of the residential uh, areas and occasionally have warned people to be a bit quieter. I'm glad to say that the police commissioner has been alerted and the police now have a designated officer uh, to keep an eye on this. But, um, um, again, uh, they have difficulty because th these are in private uh, residential uh, dwellings. And so I think the point today of the debate is to try and ask the Minister, who we, we've moved as a government a whole raft of antisocial uh, behaviour uh, with actually a slightly lower threshold point, um, uh, which should be a, a more efficient way uh, to use and, and control the situation. So I have a number of uh, questions which I, I will be firing at the Minister uh, on that. But this is you know, a real uh, problem uh, for my constituents. This is it's ruining people's lives. Uh, they are fearful um, when the weekend comes along, uh, that they, they may face a further weekend of, of disruption. I would also point out that legislation on the statute book at the moment in London makes this actually a, a legal thing in London. The um, uh, Section 25.1 of the Greater London General Powers Act 1973, temporary sleeping accommodation, um, uh, is, it outlaws this. This couldn't happen in Bromley or Harrow or Westminster. And indeed, with the Olympics, most of the local authorities were very um, uh, keen to uphold this legislation and stop people letting off homes for, for weekend parties. But this does happen now in Poole. I understand it's a bigger problem in Brighton, but I think Brighton is probably more of a, a town used to um, uh, uh, parties at weekends. It's becoming a problem in Bournemouth and Poole because there are the homes available. And of course, if you're somebody trying to sell a home and it's on the market for five or six months and you can generate another 15 or 20,000 pounds by weekend parties, then um, it, it, it's uh, something which uh, you can make benefit from, from it, but at the expense of upsetting your neighbours' lives. Um, I have been aware for a little time, because I've had an exchange of emails with my constituents that this is a growing problem, but I think I've only in the last few weeks really become aware of, of how difficult it is for constituencies with the number of homes involved, which are growing all the time. It is changing the nature of the area. Um, stag do's, hen parties, there are appropriate areas that have them. There are areas that would welcome them um, in order to generate money and get the young people into, but in the residential area like Camford Cliffs or Sandbanks, it's inappropriate. And because people, when they've drunk a lot, do cause antisocial behaviour, it is causing great concern to my constituents. Uh, I really think this needs to be acted on, otherwise the situation will get worse. And I fear that the anger of my constituents is such that some of them will take the law into their own hands because they've spent all their life uh, working for a home and they find it's being disturbed weekend after weekend after weekend. It is running people down, and they indeed are very angry indeed, which is why I brought the debate today. What I really uh, would like to find out from the Minister is um, 
Uh, we, we've got rid of the antisocial behaviour orders, mainly because most of them were ignored and they've become discredited. We now have a, a raft of new antisocial uh, behaviour um, uh, legislation. And um, clearly the behaviour of some of the party goers is inappropriate, but you know, they bought a proposition. I don't particularly blame them. Uh, they are coming uh, down to have a party. But I do blame the people um, who are promoting uh, these sort of parties. Um, um, Michelle um, King, who runs Deluxe Holiday Homes, who I think has had a checkered past, uh, she um, is renting out these properties. Um, uh, the owners of the properties who are making a lot of money out of this and uh, I, I would have no problem with these people running uh, these um, events in an appropriate area. And I do know sometimes there are places in rural areas where there are fields where it's, um, noise isn't going to be such a factor. But in a residential area, in a tree-lined area like Pool, in a, a quiet residential neighbourhood, this is the most inappropriate um, activity, and we do need to take some action. So um, somehow, either by um, taking action against the agents or actions against the owners some of whom are my constituents as well, I'm, I'm sorry to say, um, we need to, 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 to nip this activity in the bud because it is actually having a very detrimental effect to my constituents in Poole. Um, when I uh, uh, represented Poole, I have uh, since 1997, um, I didn't expect to be, uh, after a few years, to be having a debate on this particular topic because I didn't think this would be the sort of thing that would come up. And, uh, um, it, you know, several homes being used for this inappropriate activity could easily become 10, 12, 14, 15. And the reason is, of course, there's an awful lot of money in this sort of weekend activity. Um, a constituent uh, uh, sent, sent, sent me a, um, a thing the other day off the, off the net, said that um, apart from about £700 a night, sometimes uh, in, the, in the summer some of these homes can go for £1,200 a night. Well, you know, two or three nights, that's a nice earner for somebody. Uh, there are big incentives for people to do this. Uh, I think they're sailing very close to the, the law. I think we have to find a way either by using um, antisocial behaviour or change of use or the environmental health people to crack down on this and to give my constituents a break, which they so rightly deserved after work, working so hard uh, for their, um, to, to retire uh, in what they hoped was a peaceful neighbourhood and not to be at the centre um, and living next door to either stag do's, hen parties, raves, or, and sometimes the most outrageous behaviour. Thank you. Minister. Uh, Mr Sanders, can I first of all apologise for being a minute or two adrift at the beginning, both to you and to our old friend, the member for Paul. Uh, but can I say it's very helpful, in my view, that he's raised uh, this particular matter uh, on debate, and I congratulate him for doing so, because it's one that is a relatively new phenomenon, but one that can affect people and communities in quite profound ways, as he's indicated in his remarks. So as well as listening to his informed contribution today, I've also seen his letter to the Home Secretary on behalf of Councillor May Haynes of Paul Borough Council, uh, highlighting the issue of houses rented out for hen and stag parties and their effect on the community in the Canford Cliffs Ward. Um, current noise regulation is complex and can be difficult for councils to deploy, but the new powers in the Antisocial Behaviour, Crime and Policing Act will help councils to prevent and stop noise nuisance quickly and simply, and I will uh, expand on that uh, shortly. Um, it's just worth saying by way of background that the coalition government has, of course, overseen a fall in crime of more than 10% since 2010, according to the Independent Crime Survey, and this is, in fact, mirrored by and large by the fall in the police-recorded crime figures. Alongside that, there's been a significant drop in the number of antisocial behaviour incidents reported to the police from 3.2 million in 2010-11 to 2.2 million last year. However, this figure is still far too high and is probably only the tip of the iceberg. And my honourable friend has drawn attention to one particular manifestation in his contribution today. Now, we know that the police councils and others are there to help, but it's also clear from the hundreds of responses we received in our consultation on antisocial behaviour in 2011 that these agencies can feel constrained by the tools currently available to them Many are overly bureaucratic and costly to apply for, with others so behaviour-specific as to make them inappropriate in all but the most straightforward of cases. Uh, nowhere is this starker than an example raised today, and that's one of the reasons we've moved away from those behaviour-specific offences to more general offences, which give councils and the police and others more flexibility. Now, tackling noise nuisance can be challenging and time-consuming, but there are some powers available to local authorities. The Noise Act 1996 
gives councils powers to specifically tackle noise from houses at night. If noise exceeds a certain level between 11pm and 7am, an officer can serve a warning notice on the person responsible for the noise. The notice will require them to reduce the noise within a specified time. If this doesn't happen, the officer can issue an on-the-spot fine of up to £100, can seize any equipment that was used to make the offending noise, such as music systems or televisions, or can choose to prosecute the person if if convicted, a magistrate can fine the person up to £1,000. Local authorities also have power to tackle noise nuisance under the Environmental Protection Act 1990. If the noise is emitted from premises, is unreasonably loud and is substantially interfering with a neighbour's enjoyment of their property, it can be classed as a statutory nuisance. And local authorities can serve an abatement notice that requires those making the noise to stop. In fact, local authorities have a duty to serve an abatement notice where they find a statutory nuisance. The abatement notice is served on the person responsible for the nuisance. But if the person responsible cannot be found, for example, they've left the premises, it can be served on the owner of the premises. The notice will relate to noise emitted from the premises. Environmental health officers have a wide discretion as to what they include in the notice to make sure that the noise nuisance stops and does not recur. The notice remains in place on the property until the council decides to withdraw it. Breaching an abatement notice can lead to prosecution and large fines. Too often, though, police and councils are prevented from taking swift and effective action because of the limitations of these powers. In particular, in a case of so-called party houses, it can be difficult to apply the noise nuisance legislation in every situation. For example, noise from people inside a premises may not exceed the specified level in the Noise Act. Serious noise nuisance from people in the street who are causing harms to others, in other words, outside of premises, is not covered by current noise legislation, In addition, the notices can only impose requirements that are reasonable and ultimately breaching an abatement notice is subject to a defence of reasonable excuse. So an owner may successfully argue that it's not reasonable to expect them to control the behaviour of everyone in the property, particularly when they're only staying for one or two nights. Now, my honourable friend and I had a conversation briefly, um, I think it was yesterday, so I promised to look into planning matters for him to see whether there were any planning controls. Um, I'm advised that where landlords allow this behaviour to occur, it can also be difficult to hold into account. Some areas have looked to planning rules to try to address the issue. However, save for us a few specific areas, planning cannot control short-term letting of a property because this does not amount to development as is defined in planning legislation. Uh, I'm advised that the only trigger for planning would be if the use of the house fell within a different use class. For example, if it was used as a, as a house of multiple occupation or a bed and breakfast. However, I've asked my officials further to investigate whether if a house is regularly used over a period of weeks, uh, such as that it becomes a standard feature for that house to be used, whether that might not qualify for a change of use, because effectively it's being used as a business, but particularly if the person who's renting out the property is receiving a financial um, reward for doing so. And that's a matter which we haven't yet had an answer from my colleagues at Communities and Local Government Department, but I've asked officials to take it further, uh, and I'll write to my honourable friend about that specific matter. Um, now, it's, uh, it's clear that the current system is fragmented, complex, sometimes inadequate, and is not working for the communities in Poole and many other places. Not because agencies don't want to help, but because they find it difficult to find a way to do so. And obviously we want that to change. Um, and the impact antisocial behaviour has on victims and communities has to, has, become, has to become central to their response. And it's also worth saying, and my honourable friend referred to fields, for example, though I would caution him that fields sometimes do, uh, raves and fields do sometimes generate opposition, that what might be considered antisocial in one situation may be perfectly acceptable in another, and therefore the location is quite important in these, in these matters. So we have to give professionals tools that are flexible enough to adapt to each situation where antisocial behaviour is being committed. And that's what we've done with the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act. And I hope I'll be able to say some comments which are helpful to my honourable friend in that regard. As a member of the Public Bill Committee, he will, of course, be more aware than most of the reforms the coalition government has introduced in this Act. While this specific form of antisocial behaviour was not discussed in the committee, I want to assure him and the House that there is, in my view, sufficient flexibility in the new powers to allow the Council to act and act quickly to deal with the situation which he has described. In fact, such as a flexibility, there's not just one power that's applicable, but two which might be used, allowing the council and police to design their response to any situation on reasonable grounds. Firstly, there's a closure power. Uh, The power is likely to bring swift response and and respite for victims and be most effective in a situation is the new closure power. Although the current closure powers can be effective in some cases, they've never been able to to close non-licensed premises quickly, out of court, 
uh, on the likelihood of antisocial behaviour occurring, acting preventatively, meaning that police and councillors have been limited in what they can do. The new closure power will address this loophole. If a police or council officer has reason to believe that use of a premises has resulted in nuisance to members of the public, or there could be if a notice was not issued, important distinction there, or there has been disorder near those premises, or there could be if the notice is not issued, then that premises can be closed immediately. While those who habitually reside in the premises cannot be excluded for the first 48 hours, members of the stag or hen party would not fall within this definition and so could be excluded from entering the property completely. Because this power can be used preventatively, it also means that the local community need not suffer waiting for action to occur and so the harm caused by that party could be prevented altogether. Moreover, where the issue persists, the council or police force could apply to the local magistrate's court to have the closure extended up to a maximum of six months, ensuring the local community is properly protected from serious nuisance, disorderly, offensive or criminal behaviour. Now, there's also a, a further power which might be used, and that's the community protection notice. This out-of-court notice is available to councils, the police and, in some instances, social landlords to deal with persistent, unreasonable behaviour that's having a detrimental effect on the quality of life of those in the locality. The kind of behaviours that have been discussed today, uh, noise to drunkenness and so on, could all fall within a definition in this test. What's more, the definition of persistent is open to the interpretation of the council or police officer. For instance, if the, if the issue is loud music accompanying a barbecue in the garden, it would be perfectly reasonable if the officer had asked him to turn it down and he had not done so to consider this persistent. First, a written warning has to be issued to someone who can reasonably be expected to control or affect the behaviour explaining what the issue is. Once they've been given sufficient time to change this behaviour, which could be minutes in the case of turning down loud music, a community protection notice can be issued, forcing them to comply with the request. If they do not do so, they commit an offence and can be arrested. On successful prosecution, not only does this carry a criminal record, but also a potential of a £2,500 fine. What's more, the community protection notice could be used against a homeowner who is allowing the stag and hen dues to act antisocial. I know my honourable friend has rightly, in my view, drawn attention to the issue of those who facilitate these uh, parties rather than simply those who turn up. And I agree that's an important distinction to make. So this, the community protection notice could involve any requirements that the council or police thought appropriate to prevent the antisocial behaviour. For instance, to pass on details of those attending to local agencies so that the situation could be monitored, or requiring the homeowner to warn those attending the party that acting antisocial could result in the premises being closed. Currently, councils are the lead force in dealing with these kinds of cases, even though it is regularly the police the victims turn to. That is why these new powers will not just be for council officers, but also for the police, and in the case of the community protection notice, even PCSOs, so that the right person can act every time without needing to refer victims from one agency to the other, which is inefficient and time-consuming. Councils and police forces have the same objective, to ensure that the communities they serve are protected and safe. And by working effectively together, they can achieve this. The new powers we are introducing encourage agencies, uh, encourages agencies to problem solve together to ensure victims and communities get the best results. So I believe that the new powers being introduced later this year will allow councils and the police to deal with the kinds of situations that my honourable friend has described this morning. But I want to be clear that these kinds of short-term renting arrangements do not always result in antisocial behaviour. The additional tourism and boost to the local economy of holding makers looking for short term lets can be positive to areas and communities, and this should be encouraged. And that's why these powers are flexible um, and enable people to make judgments on, on the basis of what they actually find. Uh, I thank the Minister for giving way. Can I um, thank the Minister for the constructive and helpful way he is replying to the debate? I think. Um, some of these uh, um, ideas, I think, will be uh, very well taken by my constituents and I think give us something to work on. Uh, I'm very grateful and I'm, I'm glad that's, um, that's how he feels about matters. And uh, uh, as I say, I'll be interested to see how this matter develops, particularly when the new powers are, are uh, in force. Uh, just in conclusion, Mr. Sanders, let me say that um, I want to make it clear whether the behaviour of individuals goes beyond what's acceptable and the result is harm, misery um, and dis discomfort to others. Um, innocent parties and local agencies should be able to act and act fast. I believe the new powers that the coalition government is introducing later this year through the Antisocial Behaviour Bill, uh, now the Act, will encourage us by delivering on our promise to simplify the existing raft of powers available to frontline professionals and by putting victims at the heart of the response to antisocial behaviour.
suspend the sitting until half past two o'clock this afternoon.